the immutability of God, changeless, constant, set, settled, stable, steadfast, unaltered, unvarying, immovable, unchanging for the better. For God is perfect. He stands alone as the true embodiment and standard of goodness. All that is good is in him. All that is good comes from him. He is and was and always be good. The uncaused cause, he is steadfast and unwavering in his will and purpose, holding all things together by the word of his power. He is the cause and source of all true stability. He does not change for the worse. For he is a standard unto himself. He is accountable to no one but himself. And because he is good, all that issues forth from him is also good. His character is not sharpened by any outside influence, nor does he suffer internal conflicts which threaten his righteousness. There is a sense in which we can say that for God to cease in any way to be good would mean he ceased to be God. His immutability is central to his godhood. He is good, and all good things come from him. So if he ceased to be good, it would compromise the existence of all goodness. He is unchanging. If he changed, all sureness and stability would be altered. Everything from moral and spiritual constancy to the law of gravity would be irrevocably compromised if God was not immutable. For there would be nothing and no one left to sustain or restore these realities. All true hope stands upon the immutability of God's character and his purpose. Amen. Purpose. His purpose issues from his character. These two things are never at variance within God. Humanity is introduced to God as one with a purpose, the creator. Truly everything that exists knows him by this name, their creator. Elohim, we see that in Genesis 1.1, the first name by which we hear of God. The God who creates, the creating God, the one who brings into existence, God who originates, he causes things to be. And because he is good, what he makes is good. He had made Lucifer too, he was good. But when he rebelled against his creator, he rebelled against goodness, and it was no longer found in him. Yes. Still, God was still good. God was still good. Yes. And when, in the form of a serpent, this fallen angel tempted Eve, and both she and her husband challenged God's goodness and purpose, the image of good became marred in them, and their environment and offspring, too, suffered. That which was good and blessed became sinful and cursed. An impossibly hopeless situation, if not for the immutability of God's own character and purpose. Yes. Generations later, God appeared to a man named Abram, a man who lived after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, and like so many others, Yet uh, God speaks to him. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, they shall be, you shall be blessed shall be blessed. Now through Adam, the world was cursed. Here is a man through whom God promises to bless. Amen. Yes. Not only that, but all those who oppose this man will be opposed by God himself. But Abram's wife, Sarai, was barren. So according to their limited understanding of the promise, Abraham bore a son with Hagar, Sarai's handmaid. This was Ishmael. But he was not to be the child of promise. The blessing and promise to God 
to Abraham rather, was not inherent in Abraham, but bestowed upon him by God. And God would determine how the promise was to be fulfilled. He later revealed to them that out of an aged and barren womb, Sarai, Abram's seed of blessing would come. So God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. And when they were past the years of childbearing, they bore Isaac, the promised child. He could, God could remove the curse and pronounce his blessing because he is immutable. His goodness is not compromised when others fail to be good. His sureness is not compromised when others are unfaithful. Amen. And his promise proved sure because his promise is immutable. And Abra after Abraham died, he blessed his son Isaac with the same blessing God had given him. Now Isaac's wife Rebekah was also barren, yet the promise of his father was given to him. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He must have learned from the testimony of his parents for he remained with Rebecca and sure enough from her barren womb came life. Two sons struggling while still in the womb. When Rebekah asked the Lord about this internal struggle, he told her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the, the old shall serve the younger. God's promise to Abraham of making him a great nation remained strong. And when the twins were born, first came Esau. And soon followed Jacob, grasping his elder brother's heel. Indeed, as a man, Esau despised his father's birthright and sought it with tears as his younger brother took hold of the blessing of God's promise, having desired it far more than his elder brother. And Isaac, having plans to bless Esau, blessed Jacob as God had foreordained with the blessing that had been given to him and his father before him. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be any, everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. God determined the vessels of his goodness and his promise remained sure. Jacob lived to see his son Joseph feeding all the nations of the world before he died and he blessed Joseph's sons and his own sons according to his own blessing. Now God revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob increasingly throughout their lives. To Abraham, as Melchizedek blessed him, Abraham came to know God as Jehovah El Elyon, Most High God. As Abraham became increasingly aware of his complete dependence on God to provide the offspring which God had promised him. He knew God as the Lord God. And as God renewed his promise to Abraham, Abraham came to know his God as El Shaddai, Almighty God. Both Abraham and Isaac saw of God when he called them to sacrifice everything, that he was Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, mm -hmm. he, he determined in his heart that God was a God who sees. And that is what he calls God to his son, the God who sees. God will see. He will see my faith. He will see his promise. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, God's mark was placed upon him and his name changed to Israel. And he found God gave him favor with his brother. And Jacob built an altar to the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now God had changed his name to Israel 
and he built an altar to the God of Israel, right. taking a very personal note there. When Jacob put away all the foreign gods of his household, he experienced the protection of his family, and as they traveled through treacherous ways, he built an altar to El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And yes, it does say that, the God of the house of God, getting right back to the one true God. Mm -hmm. There is one true God, Amen. and he is immutable. God, for all his many way, ways and names, is not divided in himself. His names do not signify change or conflict, but expand upon the depth of his personhood and assures us of the goodness of his person and his promises. Now the patriarchs have believed God's promises and seen his hand at work, and they died believing God would fulfill his promises. Now Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead and buried. The Hebrew children are multiplying and so numerous that the Pharaoh in the land which they dwell peaceably now considers them a threat and the people of God are now slaves of men. For hundreds of years, their bondage continues, but God does not forget his promise. Yeah. His goodness and blessing have not faded. The offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stand in need of deliverance and the fulfillment of his divine promise. And before a burning bush, which is not consumed for the fire, a man by the name of Moses stands, shoes removed, upon ground made holy by the presence of Elohim, the Most High God, Lord God, Almighty God, the Lord Provider, the God who sees. And Moses with hidden face hears the voice of God through crackling and roaring flames say, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land into a good land and large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Certainly I will be with thee and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said to God, When I come to the children of Israel, and shall I say to them, What is your name? And he said, Aye, Asher, Aye. To this question, the unchanging God answers, I am that I am. This is my name forever. Amen. The promise still stands. Mm -hmm. Amen. The text is Exodus chapter 3. In verse 14, Sister Ada referred to these verses already. I'm going to read them in a, a different translation. Then Moses said to God in verse 13, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. I think you will see that this is the logical starting point for a weekend of messages on the immutable counsel of God. We, we, we have to start here with the revelation in this text. 
Now, when you meet someone that you don't know, the first thing you do to begin a new relationship is you get the person's name. What's your name? Well, my name is... If you don't know someone's name, they're a stranger to you. You don't know them, and there is a kind of distance that's created between you and that person. There is a, there is a sense of alienation or strangeness. They're a stranger to you. And if they don't know your name, you're a stranger to them. Now, just knowing a person's name doesn't mean you instantly know that person intimately. There's much more to learn after you learn someone's name, but at least knowing their name is a step in the right direction. It's the first step in a relationship, removing the mystery of complete anonymity. A nameless person is a stranger and a mystery in the same way that being in a nameless place means that you are probably lost. If you were somewhere and someone called you on the phone and said, where are you? You said, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You, you're probably in trouble because you're in a nameless place. You don't know where you are. In, uh, in grade school, we learn the definition of a noun. A noun is a person, a place, or a thing. But nouns need names, or these persons, places, and things remain strange and unknown to us. And remember that what is unknown is potentially dangerous and not to be trusted. We teach our children, don't trust a stranger. You don't know what they might do, what their, you don't know what their intentions might be. So being able to name things or to name, to know people's names, it makes those things or those people knowable. It makes them familiar, even comforting. So what is God's name? What is God's name? Many people in our generation have probably never considered that question because, of course, God's name is just God. That's what we call him. But did you know that God is not a name at all? God is a generic term. It's like saying that I own a car or that I live in a house. You don't know anything about my car or my house. Those are generic terms. It says very little about the object that's being identified. So God's name is not God. That's, that's just a generic term that basically means deity. Yeah, that's right. Most people today have never asked about God's name because our cultural context is not exactly like the cultural context in which God spoke to Moses in our text. You see, we're not, we don't live in a culture that is crowded with deities like the ancient world. The Egyptians had many gods. And that's where Israel was, by the way. When, when God appeared to Moses and spoke these words, Israel was in Egypt still. The, the, the goal was to get them out. But they're still there in the midst of that, what we call polytheistic culture. Many gods. Now, if you enter a room full of strangers, knowing everyone's name suddenly becomes very practical. It's just so that you can make distinctions between one person and another. Every, otherwise, everyone would kind of just gel together and there would be no individuality at all. So you see, the God of the Bible reveals himself to the people of Israel in this polytheistic context, which is why Moses anticipated that the people would ask the logical question, which God sent you? There were no atheists in the ancient world. Uh, athe intellectual and philosophical atheism, atheism is a construction of modern Western culture. The problem in the ancient world wasn't atheism, that there isn't a God at all. The problem in the ancient world was which God is which? 
Which God's the true God? Is there a God who's above all of the other gods? These were the kind of questions that were pertinent in that context. Now God's answer to this question, what's your name, is the surprising and profoundly wonderful revelation, I am who I am. But that's not a name either. That's not a name either. It's a description of something about God's nature. And it's a vague description that bears some analysis, that that needs some unpacking. God's answer to Moses' question is like meeting someone for the first time, and you hold out your hand and you say, what's your name? And they reply, well, I'm just me. I'm just myself. Well, they didn't answer your question. (laughs) You would think, if someone did that to you, you would think that they were intentionally being evasive and that they didn't want you to know anything about them. If someone did that to you, you would, th- you would think, this person doesn't want me to be close to them. They don't want me to know them because they, they won't even give me their name. They're remaining at a distance. They're alienating themselves from me. But that's not what God is doing in this passage at all. God's not being evasive. He's doing exactly the opposite of that, but he's doing it in a surprising way because he's God. And we would expect him to be different than any other person that we might meet on the street. The revelation of the divine name is so important in Scripture because it is really a revelation of the divine nature. And it is also a revelation, if we understand the context, which is what Sister Ada was laboring to give you, It is a revelation also of the divine purpose. That's all wrapped up in this statement, waiting for us to unpack. I am who I am. God has revealed himself as the absolute fact, the unchanging bedrock on which everything else rests and on which everything else is built. This includes God's solid, unchanging purpose to save and to bless his covenant people. The revelation of God's nature and purpose is given so that his people will trust him absolutely, who is himself the absolute underneath all things. In other words, we need to understand why God said this. It's important we understand what it means, but we also need to understand the intent behind this revelation. Why did God say it? And that's why, in this case, uh, just analyzing the linguistics is not necessarily helpful. Because the Hebrew word just means to be. Uh And once you've analyzed that in the lexicon, you're still left asking, what does this mean? Why would God say something like that? Here's why. And it's, it's amazingly simple, yet it's profound. God is giving us a reason to trust Him. Amen. God is giving us a reason to have faith in Him. That's why He says, I am who I am. And we need a reason to have faith in God. We need a reason to trust God, or God would not have given this revelation. The revelation here is the basis for a covenant relationship with God. That's why God is speaking to Moses. That's God's intention. God's intention is to bring Israel out of Egypt, and he's going to make a covenant with them. They're going to be his people, and he's going to be their God. That's what's going on in this passage. And so this revelation is not so that we can have a casual acquaintance with God. This, this revelation is not given so that uh, we can have just a one-time meeting, like meeting someone at a wedding. And, hi, how are you? My name is Joe, and yes, my name is Bob, and then you never see them again, and you don't really care. And that's not what's going on here. Amen. 
Uh, God, please don't think I'm being irreverent, but God is not into dating. He wants a partner. He wants a wife. God wants a people, a covenant people. And so this knowledge of God's name is the prelude to marriage. That's what a covenant is. This is not just, this revelation of God's name is not just so that we can be theologians and be intellectual. Oh, wow, isn't that nice? Isn't that neat that we know God's name now? Now, what, what's for lunch? No, it's not that kind of thing at all. I think that it's unfortunate that people today seem to want a casual relationship with God, kind of like a dating relationship, you know, where it's not really that serious. There aren't really any obligations. You're not really in covenant with the person that you're dating. At least that's how we do it in our culture anyway. Not every culture does it the way we do. But you see, people today, they want to just kind of date God. They don't want to be in a covenant relationship with God because that involves obligation. And people, see, people today want to be free to date God and then date other lovers as well. And that's the one thing God will not allow. People today think they want a God of love, but they are not prepared for all the implications of God really loving them. Like, in another place, God says, my name is Jealous. That's my name. You see, there's no question about the love of God. The big question is, what about our love for him? That's the real question. And the fact is, is that we're not born loving God. We're not, in fact, we're we're not born knowing about God at all. Adam's race is in a state of alienation. From God, from the one true living God who created us and everything else. This alienation or distance is caused by sin and it implies ignorance. Just as we are alienated from strangers we don't know and have never met, we are ignorant of our creator, the one true living God. The trouble, of course, with God and knowing God is that God is not someone that we can just walk across the room and meet. It's not so simple. God is not someone you meet on the street. The most obvious problem is that God is spirit, which means that he is invisible to the senses. God made the world, the physical world that we experience through our senses, but God is not a part of that world that we experience through our senses. And that means that he cannot be known as we come to know other things. Everything that is around us, we come to know through experience. We come because we can see it or taste it or touch it or smell it or feel it. That's not possible with God. God is spirit. He's not tied to the physical world. God is not a part. He's not an emanation of the the physical world like the pantheists believe. And there are a lot of people today who are pantheists. They believe that nature is somehow divine. But that's not what the Bible teaches about God. Men can know certain things about the world around him through philosophical deduction and scientific investigation, but the world by its wisdom cannot know God. So we can get in a spaceship and we can fly around the earth, we can fly to Mars and never meet God. That's not how you meet God. That's not how you come to know God. You can seek your whole life for God. And if he doesn't reveal himself to you, you will never know him. We would never know him apart from his revelation. The creation speaks of the existence of a creator. And actually man is held responsible for this, what we call natural revelation. Along with the logical implication that we ought to spend our lives seeking the creator. 
And I'm, I'm drawing on passages that you know. Romans chapter 1, Acts chapter 17, Paul's sermon in, on Mars Hill there in the city of Athens. Creation is declaring the glory of God. Men ought to be able to look at the natural world and conclude that there is a God, at least to be able to conclude that there is a creator, there's a higher power, if you will, if I can use that term. But creation or natural revelation only tells us that there is a God. It does not tell us what kind of God there is. Except perhaps maybe that he is wise and powerful. He must be. To create the complexities of the world around us, he must be powerful and he must be wise. But other than that, what can creation tell us? If, if we are to understand that God is good, or that God is kind, or that he cares about us at all, these things have to be revealed through some kind of special revelation. You will not get that from nature. And I know there's a lot of people today who um, want to study nature and be close to nature, and people will say, it makes me feel close to God. And I, I understand why they say that. And people might even say, I know God loves me because I saw a beautiful sunset this morning, but that's not why they know God loves them. That's right. They've heard that someplace else. Yeah. And the sunrise is reminding them of what they've heard someplace else. Creation's voice has not been silenced, but it has been frustrated. And we might conclude by only studying nature that God is cruel and uncaring. I mean, what kind of God makes a great white shark? Or a python? But the problem is more complex than just our ignorance of God. It's not simply that we just need more information. It's not that simple. I wish it were that simple. But there is something in human nature. There's something called the flesh that is hostile to God. In fact, the human race has already rejected the information God left behind in the creation and chosen to worship the creation rather than the creator. That's Romans chapter 1. So it's not that God hasn't given us information. He's given everybody information. His fingerprints are all over this world. And men and women in their sin, in their willful ignorance, suppress the truth. They suppress the truth of the Creator God. And man has always been spiritually promiscuous. The Bible calls it idolatry. The ancient pantheon crowded with deities has been transformed into the modern intellectual paganism of pluralism and tolerance today, but the result is exactly the same. Man continues to reject the absolute truth of God and worship idols. We're more sophisticated today, perhaps. It's more intellectual than it was in the ancient world where they actually would make a graven image and bow down and worship it. You can still see that in some places in the world. In the Western world, we're a little more sophisticated about it, but it's still idolatry. People today don't have a problem with the idea of a God or a higher power, whatever that might be. A God who may or may not exist, but we really can't know for sure. And whoever this God is, he doesn't intrude into our lives and tell us how to live. Oh, no, he would never do that. He would never make moral demands upon us, see. But people today get very uncomfortable with a God who defines himself, who is specific, who tells us that he is this and not that, and then expects us to do something in response to who and what he is. Oh, this makes people very nervous today. That's the one, that's the unforgivable sin of our culture. You could say anything you want about God theoretically. Just don't tell us exactly what God is. That's, that's absolute, and we don't, we don't believe in absolutes in this culture. 
you notice God names himself here? Moses doesn't get to name God. I don't know if you've ever... I've heard people say jokingly, you know, what should we call you? Oh, just call me anything you want. You ever heard somebody say that? What's your name? Oh, it's John or Joe. You just call me whatever you want. Any nickname will do. You know, ha, ha, ha. God doesn't do that. God doesn't say, well, just take a poll, you know. Have the Israelites decide what they want to call me. Or Moses, what do you think? What, what do you think would be a good name? For me, you know. When the first thing a couple does when they're going to have a child is, what, what are we going to name the child? Nobody has a child and says, uh, honey, what would you like to, for us to call you? See, there's a, there's a pecking order being established. Right? Remember God brought all the animals to Adam so that he could see what he would call them. And that's because God's creation was originally given to man for him to rule over. But man doesn't rule God. So man doesn't get to name God. God names himself. We are not allowed to name our own version of deity or create a God that we would like to worship. God is who he is. And we must accept who God is, not make the God we would like. Amen. Amen. So we don't get to name God. I am who I am is a statement about the absolute reality of God. He's standing there immovable, like the rock of Gibraltar, like the very foundations of the earth. No wonder the scripture says there is no rock like our God. Amen. Amen. And you can build your life on that rock. Amen. Or, or you can be shattered upon it. But one thing that's never going to happen is you're never going to move that rock. You're never going to budget. It's never going to change. And here's where we begin to think about the word immutability a little bit. It means unchangeable, unchanging. God stands, I am who I am means God stands unaffected by change. Time does not change God. And God does not decay. He is not subject to corruption. Those things cannot touch the divine nature. We're talking about God's nature. His, his essential character is immutable. It does not change. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be, and I will always be that. God is unmoved, for example, by man's changing views of theology. That doesn't change God at all. We can change our theology. It doesn't change God. We may change our view of God, but that doesn't change God. God is unmoved and unchanged by the latest progressive philosophy. God is unmoved by the shifting sands of cultural trends, which the church seems to be enslaved to today. You know, every year the, the, the pop culture changes, and what was in last year isn't in anymore to this year. Men value being progressive. We want to be progressive, which involves change and a movement from imperfection toward perfection or from ignorance toward enlightenment. So men admit that they are not immutable. We admit, even secular people admit, that we want to be progressive. It means we want to change. We want to get the latest thing, you know. Change implies imperfection, incompleteness, or weakness, and vulnerability to some greater, more powerful force. So you may not want to change, but there may be a force that acts upon you that makes you change. See? Is there any force that can act upon God that makes him change? No. If there were, that thing, that force, whatever it is, would be God. 
Given enough time, wind and rain can erode a mountain. Now, what is stronger than a mountain? What is bigger than a mountain? What is more stable than a mountain? I don't know. Ask the folks in uh, Seattle, Washington. You know what happened there, right? When we lived in L.A., we heard about this all the time. Whole sides of a mountain would come down. Get enough rain soaking into the earth. There's nothing to hold it there. It gives way. Mudslide. Are mountains immutable? Well, they look like they are, don't they? But they're not. They change. There may be some mountains that are not quite as high as they once were. Because given enough time and the forces of nature working upon them, they change. Maybe very, very small changes, but changes nonetheless. But God's not like that. Even though he's compared to a mountain in Scripture, that's just to give us an idea of who God is. All things in the created order are subject to the powerful forces of time and decay. The creation itself is subjected to the bondage of corruption. So everything changes. And it doesn't change for the better. We have order going to chaos, not the other way around in nature. And so the hymn writer could say, change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. One of the outstanding lessons of the Old Covenant is the absolute separateness of God from everything we see in the world. I may have just coined a new word there, separateness. You know what separateness means? It means holiness. God is separate from everything we see in the created order. He is holy. God stands separate from this world outside of time. The scripture says he inhabits eternity. He is untouched by decay or by corruption because he is outside of time. Now, God's separateness or God's holiness makes human beings uncomfortable because we fear what is not like us. We fear what is unfamiliar to us. We greatly fear, for example, staring into the face of some alien life form like we've seen on so many Hollywood movies. Some, some being utterly strange yet vastly superior with unknown intentions. This is the stuff of horror. It's no wonder that the ancient superstitious fear of the gods has been replaced by the modern fear of science fiction aliens invading from another planet. There's just this innate fear in us of something that's not, of encountering some being, some force that's not like us, that's strange to us, that's, that's superior to us. But that's exactly what God is. He's holy. We fear holiness, which is the attribute of God, by the way, most often mentioned in Scripture. If you count all the attributes of God, how many they're mentioned, holiness is, the, is mentioned more than any of the other attributes. Surprisingly, it's more than love, much more than love. The idea that a holy God could also love people is kind of strange in and of itself when you think about it. And God's love, the love of a holy God, is only understood correctly within the context of covenant. And God taking a people for himself. God is holy, but God wants to be with his chosen people. And he's willing to go to great lengths to make that relationship happen. This revelation of God's nature and name, I am who I am, is made in the context of covenant. Where God actually speaks and has made certain promises and commitments to certain people, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants, the people of Israel. The absolute holiness of God is real, and it is intimidating. 
But the real revelation here is not God's absolute holiness, although that's true. The real revelation of I am who I am is God's absolute faithfulness Faithfulness. or consistency. God is absolutely holy, and our natural logical response is to fear him. But God is absolutely faithful, and our response to that is to trust him. Which is the real revelation of I am who I am. God will always be who he is. And that means God can be trusted. Amen. God, God has made certain promises to certain people. And these people can believe that God will keep his word. How could you trust a God who was not absolute? How could you trust a God who might suddenly change from one day to the next. What if you had a doubt in your mind? Maybe God promised this, but maybe today he's changed his mind, see? You couldn't trust a God like that. Would you, would you put your eternal destiny on a God like that? I wouldn't. <laughs> there's, in fact, there's a... There's a There's a sense in which, if this were not true about God, we would have to invent a God who was like this just to keep from going insane. Otherwise, we could never trust anything. We have trouble trusting people because they change. Most of the time, not for the better. And their words are not necessarily reliable. I've heard many people say when they're getting divorced, um, you know, I meant my vows at the time, but now she's better looking. And so people change their minds. They go back on the promises and the commitments that they've made. But God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. The only way to have a relationship is to trust. That's even true in human relationships. You can't have a relationship, at least not a good relationship, certainly not an intimate relationship, with someone that you don't trust. To have a relationship with God means we must be able to trust Him or we will only fear Him and run the other way. But the righteous shall live by faith. And we can live by faith because I am who I am. And so the scripture says our faith and hope are in the living God. You see, this, this statement, I am who I am, is not just God saying I exist. It's not, it's not, that's not what he's really saying, although it's true. But Moses didn't need to hear that. He already knew God existed. The Israelites didn't need to hear that either. They had heard about God, the God of their fathers. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists. It's got to start there. But that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, See, what if you diligently sought after God your whole life only to find that God had changed his mind? Well, that's not going to happen. Amen, amen. Do you see what he's saying here in this passage? It's, it's wonderful. Now, God not only reveals himself as I am who I am, but as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to consider this as well. God wants to be remembered for what he said to the patriarchs, the promises and the covenant that he made with them and the faith that they had in his word. If the divine nature is wrapped up in the revelation, I am who I am, then the divine purpose is wrapped up in the covenant promises that God made to the patriarchs. God had not forgotten or forsaken his original promise to Abraham, and that is why he is speaking to Moses in Exodus 3. The great I am does not forget, and so we are not forsaken. God made a promise to bless the world through Abraham's seed, and that is still God's purpose when he spoke to Moses 
from the burning bush. I love that burning bush because the nature and purpose of God burn like an eternal fire and cannot be put out. God's promise, which is God's unchanging purpose, was to bless the world through Abraham's seed, which Paul reminds us in Galatians 3 is in the singular and not the plural. Seed is what God said, not seeds. And that seed or descendant of Abraham is, of course, the Lord Jesus. Now, in his letter to the Galatian churches, Paul also said that the covenant of law was necessary before the promise to Abraham could be fulfilled. The law was added. I said the law was added. Added to what? Added to what? The promise. What promise? The one to Abraham. Because of transgression. You see, Jesus would come to save us from our sins and reconcile us to this holy unchanging God, but we would know nothing about holiness, nothing about sin, nothing about reconciliation without the law of Moses. That's right. In other words, before God could send his son into the world to save us from our sins, God had to send Moses to save the Israelites from Egypt. God was going to demonstrate what salvation was all about by bringing Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Everything about the Exodus... God sending the deliverer Moses, God judging the pagan king of Egypt, God providing the blood of the Passover lamb, God making a covenant with the people at Sinai, God bringing them into the promised land, all of these things are things that only I am could have done. And they were types and shadows of an even greater exodus Amen. that was to come and that is still to come actually. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And the blood of the new covenant has been applied. Our great high priest has gone into the holy of holies. Now we wait for our deliverer to appear again to judge this present evil world and take his people out into the promised new creation. But in the meantime, you and I are still here in the world. And in the world, we are to be the people of God. And I, I want to bring us back to this as I conclude this message because that's the intent behind this revelation. I am who I am. God is taking a people for himself. God's purpose was to have a people who are in covenant with him. Like a husband and a wife are in covenant with one another. I wonder if church people today really understand all of the implications of being the people of God. That's a heavy, heavy deal. To be in covenant with God means that He is the center of our lives. He will not stand for any competition. He's the center of everything we do. This means our first desire is to please God, to glorify God, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we're living to please God, then we will not be all that concerned about pleasing people. Are you, are you telling me you're going to be more concerned about pleasing a person whose breath is in their nostrils, who may be here one day and fall over dead the next day, instead of pleasing the one who always has been and always will be? Does that make sense? To be the people of God means we'll worship God in reverent fear, not in a cringing fear of His punishment, but as holy priests with access to God and confidence through the blood of Christ. To be the people of God means we obey His word, not the culture of Egypt. Because we're getting ready to leave Egypt behind for good, we have already cut our affections for it in our hearts. And so to belong to a holy God means we must be like Him, in agreement with Him. We must be holy or separate from the world. Why? Because he is holy. That's right. Amen. So what does it mean that when God says, I am who I am, and we are his people, what does that mean? It means that while we're in this world, we have nothing to fear. 
because the great I am is for us. And if God be for us, who could be against us? Thank you.